Hello everybody, Panzer Penguin here with uh, episode 2, I suppose, of um, Global War 1939, uh, my introduction series of videos here. Um, so we've kind of gone over the basics of how the game is played, where all the information is on the board, that some countries have various differences, or variances in what they, uh, in what they do. Uh, so now, uh, let's get into some of the heavier stuff. Uh, uh, so first, just to reiterate, I don't think I... Uh, uh, maybe I didn't mention this in my first video, but uh, you believe the ideal number of players is five or six for this game. Um, the United States and Nationalist China are as one. Russia and Communist China as uh, number two. Uh, the UK as number three, which includes the Europe and Pacific. Though you could theoretically split that between two different players. Uh, then you also have Germany, uh, you have Japan, and typically the German player plays as Italy as well. Um, so that's a, sort of a brief breakdown of the countries and who controls what. So let's take a closer examination for now at the UK side of things. As you can see by our note, we have a few different incomes for them, and this is restricted to what they can spend in those areas. So in the European side of things, which includes Africa and the United Kingdom, uh, the United Kingdom can only spend uh, 35 uh, on purchases. So what does that mean? It means that you cannot save your money and use it to build in the Pacific, in India. You have to build on this side. Uh, Canada uh, is separate, and I guess it would probably help to spell Canada right. Um, no one has mentioned that to me yet, so I apologize to any Canadian players out there for misspelling your country. As you can see, though, Canada, and much like the United States, is both on the very... Uh, left side of the map, the European side, but also on the uh, Pacific side. It doesn't really matter. They Both the United States and Canada uh, can spend their money on whichever side of the board they want. Uh, you know, you, you got to pretend that the right-hand edge and the left-hand edge of the board wrap around and touch each other. So you can move from here to here in one movement, uh, for instance. And also from here to here in one. Uh, the rule book goes into greater details on which territories are connected, but it should be pretty obvious, especially if you know your geography. So, going back to the United Kingdom, they're limited where they can uh, produce uh, units. Um, so, uh, the way we typically do play is, though, even though the South African income is considered part of the UK Europe, uh, if you're going to build troops in South Africa, we basically consider that the first unit has to be an infantry unit for South Africa, and then the UK player can build whatever it is they're building down there. Um, so, there's that. Then, uh, you, so you want to keep your purchases separate um, when you do that. Same for Canada, because you send them off to the side. Then you want to go over to the Pacific side, the Far East Command, FEC, as you see uh, over here. FEC in ANZAC, which is the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, uh, which are the blue units that represent uh, Australia, Australia and New Zealand. Um, ANZAC has its own income at 10 so they can only uh, produce in ANZAC. You can't produce British units down there. Uh, but Calcutta uh, is a interesting little uh, exception to the rule as far as the industries go. In this case, the uh, Calcutta Minor Factory can produce six units. As long as the first three units are infantry, by requirement, it can then build three units of any sort, except for capital ships. Uh, once you're at war with Japan, then you can upgrade that to a major in industry. Uh, restrictions are gone, other than the first three have to be infantry, and then you can build capital ships. Uh, likewise, Sydney can build six units instead of the normal three, and once it is at war, uh, ANZAC, the Far East Command, and the Commonwealth are all considered the same political entity. Uh, uh, so when Japan declares war on the Brits over here, they're also at war over here. However, Germany... Uh, is not at war. I don't think Germany is at war with ANZAC, but uh, well, no, I take that back. They are because they're uh, they have ANZAC troops in South Africa, and I thought they had one up in Cairo, but maybe not in this version of the game. Uh, I'll uh, have to double check uh, this mod, make sure I got all the units in the right places again. Um, so uh, there are restrictions to those uh, industries, and it is all listed up here, especially in the red writing here. It tells you exactly what you can do. Um, so that is uh, the British in a nutshell um, so now I'll go on to the minor nations the pro and 
pro-Axis and pro-Allied neutrals, the strict neutrals, and the Chinese, because uh, they're all a little bit different. Um, so we'll start here with the Chinese. So Nationalist China is controlled by the United States player, and uh, it collects an income, and even though there are no factories in China, or for the Nationalist Chinese at least, they get to produce no more than six units in any given territory, and they are allowed to produce only infantry, uh, unless the Burma Road is open, which is this red line, and by the Burma Road being open, no Axis or Japanese unit can control territory that the red line crosses through. So as long as that is open, the Chinese player can also produce uh, uh, artillery. But you may be a little confused. You may see that there's anti-aircraft gun and a aircraft over here. If they can't produce them, then what happens there? Well, technically, those are uh, what the Americans have given to the Nationalists. Uh, for the war. This is the historical Flying Tiger unit, and it gets a plus one attack and defense uh, while fighting in China, and I don't believe it can leave China. Chinese troops cannot leave China either, so that does include movement until the Japanese territory here, including Korea. This is all considered part of China. Uh, same with Hong Kong, French Indochina, and Saigon, so they are allowed to move down there. The Nationalists, represented in green, and the Communists, represented by red, are not at war with each other. The Communists can move into any unoccupied Nationalist territory, while the uh, Nationalists can only move, in, you know, reclaim Nationalist territory from the Communists, but they cannot move into China, or Communist China, unless the Japanese control these territories, at which point they can then take them over. Uh, the Communists do not collect an income. Uh, they are controlled by Russia, but they do produce one unit at the end of each turn. Uh, which is a good segue into the Axis minor nations. So throughout the map you'll see these sort of dark gray colored uh, countries. And uh, with the exception of Iraq and Argentina, uh, they collect their own income, give income to their owner, and produce their own units. So Japan just has to move a unit into Siam to activate Siam. Uh, they are allowed to build a factory in Siam, even though it's not an original territory of theirs, but they are allowed to build a factory there. And uh, the three income from Siam goes directly to Japan, and at the end of each turn, Siam is allowed to build one infantry, and that's the only unit they can build. Uh, Iraq can be liberated. It's got some value, but you don't gain any additional units once you liberate it, other than the one infantry unit already there. Which brings us uh, to the uh, most important minor factions in the game. Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, and Finland. All Germany has to do is move units uh, into these countries to activate them. Uh, because it's not a combat move, on their first turn, the German player can go straight to Romania, which activates both Hungary and Romania. Uh, the value you see on the board is the value Germany gets uh, from activating these territories every turn. Uh, while the rulebook states what uh, money the uh, miners get. So Hungary collects three, Romania collects six, and Bulgaria collects four, which they keep themselves. So if the allies of some sort take any of these territories, whatever money those countries have in the bank goes to that conquering country. Now, uh, because they can collect income, that means they also can spend it. So then those countries, these three countries here, get to produce new units with their income on the turn after they are activated. Finland is the same. Um, you collect income, you get three from activating Finland, and to activate Finland all you have to do is move a German troop into Helsinki and the other two territories come under German control as well. Um, Finland collects a fixed income of three, so you pretty much can only build infantry unless you save it every other turn and then you can probably build a tank as the uh, Germans. Uh, so that's how those work. Now you see these uh, darker green countries throughout the place. These are pro-allied neutrals. They don't produce any of their own units, but a, a allied player moving into them activates them, gains whatever value of the territory, and all those troops then join their army, including any ships. So, in this case, if the British were to put a troop on the transport here, sail over to Greece, land in Greece, they get Corinth and Crete, and the Greek fleet becomes theirs, along with these units here and the four income from the combined Greek territories. Now, uh, that also happens if, say, Germany attacks Yugoslavia but fails to conquer it, then the Yugoslavia automatically becomes British. The, the British gain the four income and control the surviving troops and ships. 
Um, so if you're going to attack a place like this, you better make sure you can uh, conquer it. Uh, while we're speaking of conquering Yugoslavia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, and along with Finland, all have some restrictions. So uh, none of these territories uh, can move their troops, and nor can the Germans launch attacks from them until certain requirements are met. To be able to move an attack from Hungary, you the Axis need to control Yugoslavia. To attack from and move the Bulgarians, you need to control Greece. For Romania, to move or attack from Romania, or with the Romanians, you need to be at war with Russia. Now, Finland uh, provides a unique opportunity to fight the Russians without actually being at war. So, the Russian player can declare war on Finland, uh, which means that they can invade Finland. Finland, however, cannot take over Russian territories. If there are German troops, like the one who comes to activate Helsinki in Finland, or any ships in the territories touching Finland, those are fair game for the Russians. And likewise, if Finland and Russia are at war, and you've got a Russian ship sitting here, this big German battleship can come up here and engage it in combat. Um, so it's the winter war, so they find a, they basically are fighting a proxy war against each other without actually being at war with each other. Poland is a strict neutral, uh, with an exception, and that is uh, when Germany declares war on Poland, they are then at war with the Allies. It's the only country that happens to. Uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is in effect, so the German player is, uh, well, they are allowed to attack East Poland and the Baltic states, but if they attack any one of those places, Russia gets a declaration of war on Germany. They don't have to wait until their income hits 48 as Russia. They can declare war on Germany uh, whenever East Poland or the Baltic states falls to the Germans. If Warsaw uh, survives the attack, much like Holland, then the British player collects their income and controls those units. Denmark, uh, small country, but it controls the Dardanelles Straits. I believe it's no, the, or no, the Dardanelles are elsewhere. I think I'm getting all these confused. Uh, but basically, uh, until Germany or an ally declares war in Denmark, all ships may pass through the Straits here. If Denmark is hostile to you, then only submarines uh, can pass through the Straits, and that goes for Gibraltar as well. If you're at war with the British, only submarines can pass through the Straits over here. While the Suez Canal is controlled by whoever controls both sides of it. So if these are split, then no ships can pass through. Uh, submarines cannot sneak through either. Uh, Turkey is where the Dardanelles Straits are. Uh, so this is where uh, Turkey has the Straits closed to everyone, so no one can move ships uh, through the Straits. Not sure why you'd want to, but until someone conquers Istanbul, that is the case. Um, there's something I'm forgetting. What am I forgetting? Talking about straight... Oh, so neutrals. Uh, so aircraft can fly over sea zones, but you cannot fly over a neutral country. You have to fly around it. Unless you're at war with the country, then the rest of it becomes hostile to you. Then you can fly over it for your movement. So even though ships cannot pass through the Dardanelles Straits, aircraft certainly can fly over them instead. So theoretically, uh, if the Caucasus was held by the Axis... Planes from Toronto could go one, two, three, four, and land there um, because they can pass over the straits. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be able to reach. Um, so that's it on neutrals. Um, when Denmark falls, the, uh, Greenland and Iceland become pro-allied. So anything can land there to activate them. There's no monetary value, but I believe it's the only way for aircraft to make it over. In one go, one, two, three. Oh no, I guess they can. They have airbase. One, two, one, two, three, four. Yeah, so the aircraft can fly direct, uh, back and forth, except for British ones. You would need an airfield up here. Or let's see, one, two, three. No, I guess not. So there probably isn't much of a point unless you're the Axis and you're invading Canada and the United States to go up there. Uh, one thing you may have noticed on the map is convoys. Uh, these little squares that say convoy, they have their nation's flag and a value. Um, so this is part of the income tracker that's considered or collected. If a German 
enemy ship of some sort is in these convoys, then when these countries go to collect their income, uh, they lose that much income from the convoy being there. The convoys don't get them, or not the convoys, the ships. The enemy doesn't get them, it just prevents the collection of those convoys. And you can see that there's various types with various values scattered throughout the map. Even in the Mediterranean with Italian convoys. Um, what else is there to go over? This should be a much shorter video. Um, I don't think there's really anything. So we went over the factories, how things move, how the different countries work. Um, so Russia and the United States have to roll at the end of their turn to collect their income. They roll two die of 12. You add them together and that's how much income they collect that turn. And you move the tracker up. And you keep going until they're either declared war on by somebody or um, they reach 48 for Russia or 80 for the United States, which then allows them to declare war and enter the war. In the case of the United States, we see the gearing up for war events. Uh, when any of this happens, the American income automatically goes up that value, uh, which brings them closer to war, kind of like in real life when things started happening around the world. Uh, their isolationism got torn away and they were kind of forced into uh, the war. Clearly, the Japanese declaring war on them brings them into the war. Um, so I think that about wraps it up um, for all the specifics of the game. Um, again, feel free to subscribe and like my videos. Leave questions in the comments, which I'll answer in future videos or directly in the comments. Add me on Steam. Uh, I go by the same name. Uh, just let me know who you are. Uh, otherwise, I may be wondering. Uh, typically... Uh, I have a Steam group as well for this game, which I'll share the link uh, to as well. And uh, hopefully uh, we can get some games going. Uh, I do have a few games going already. I can probably squeeze one or two more in. Um, but I also don't have to be the person involved in every single game. You guys can group up together and and play by yourselves. Or <laughs> play by yourself. Uh, play without me in your own games. So whatever works for you.